but then it's a sliding scale. Okay. Uh, did I, did you people see the thermos flask joke in yeah. the videos? Yeah. 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 So that's my best answer, you know, <laughs> essentially. Um, so in essence, it's to some extent, it's in the eye of the beholder. And there's another variation on that. Uh, anything that works is no longer AI. Okay, this has been the problem that I had for all my career. You know, something works, then some other people will actually something more in database control or something, you know, will try to make a slightly better, faster algorithm, and then it becomes databases. I become operating systems. Finally, the world is coming to the point now, realization that it's all AI. Right? Which is why actually, if you ask Google for news items on databases every day, or news items on operating systems every day, you will have empty inbox. If by mistake you ask for news items on AI, you cannot get any work done. Because there's just every possible article, uh, news article about technology essentially says AI is work. Everything is AI. Okay. And it's also, there is a part of it is actually also sociological. And, um, I don't know whether I mentioned it in one of the videos, um, uh, but uh, then Deep Blue, one again is Kasparov, just was considered intelligence, right? <coughs> and Deep Blue, one again is Kasparov. There are all sorts of interesting debates as to whether we still consider chess to be intelligent, uh, a sign of intelligence. Okay. Remember, you know, if your friend fails to answer 2 plus 2 correctly, then it suddenly is a sign of intelligence. Because now you want to say that the friend is dumb. But if they answer it, yes, ah, of course everybody can answer it. Now let me ask this tougher question. Right? So there were two kinds of interesting discussions at the time of the blue. And actually I should send you one of those names, which um, is basically arguing that deep blue is not intelligent at all. This is not the way humans do intelligence. And how? Because we asked ourselves, how do we play chess? And we came to the conclusion that we don't do search. Okay, Deep Blue seems to be doing search, so clearly Deep Blue is not intelligent. That's one type of argument. Okay, that confuses the ends with means. You know, if a behavior is intelligent, it's intelligent however it is produced. Okay, and the logical end of that is this thing called Chinese room argument. How many of you have heard of Chinese room argument? In the textbook, go to the philosophical foundation part and read up the Chinese room argument. We can talk about it some other time. But essentially, if, you know, this is the, if it looks like a duck, acts like a duck, it must be a duck kind of thing. Okay, so at some point of time, if it's showing intelligent behavior, then it must be intelligent. How do you know how you do your behavior? You know, saying that I just thought about it, is a very silly thing because introspection, as they say, is the worst form of psychology. And in general, people always try to, when they introspect, they try to make themselves look much better. Okay, so you would actually probably did brute force search, but when you tell, you know, when you reinvent the history and tell your friends about how you came to these conclusions, you will never say, working and working and working and working and working, 25 years and slowly I got the answer. That's not, that's not going to make a good novel. That's not going to make a great Nova program on PBS. You have to say, I was doing this, I was doing this. And then one day I was walking to Starbucks. Then I saw this puppy, and suddenly I had the insight. <laughs> that makes for, how many of you seen um, Life of Pi, right? Yeah, yeah. so end, end part of Life of Pi is what I'm talking about. You know. um, essentially, we invent facile descriptions that make us feel romantically a lot more happier. Okay. And so that may not necessarily be the way we actually did it. Some descriptions look nicer. Okay. Um, for us. Um, anyway, so that's one thing. The other interesting thing about Deep Blue was uh, at the time, it's an apocryphal story, that at the time of Deep Blue, um, AI was not a was not a particularly favorite topic in industries. Okay, people basically thought of it as a failed technology. Okay, and so the story goes that uh, IBM Mark Russ sent mail to its employees saying, you know, it's fine, we should talk about deep blue, but don't say the word AI. Okay, so there was a time when AI was not AI. I'm assuming that everybody would you agree whether you think 2 plus 2 is AI or not, you would agree that deep blue is doing AI. You know, because we 
for all our history, we thought chess is a sign of intelligence. And then it improves in the game. I mean, it improves in chess, so it must be intelligent. But you know, I mean, said we should be looking at, we should be calling it AI. So we went from, there was a time when AI was not AI, to now everything is AI. In fact, I would try to bring stories, new stories, new type, news items, um, you know, that are ridiculous. Basically, they will be like a thermos flask level of AI. Okay, but anything, if you want, if you are a journalist and you are a tech journalist and you want to write some article, you say things like databases, nobody cares about what you say. You have to say AI. Okay, and so some of them are really, you know, you know while the line is not like a bright red line, you can tell which ones are farther away from, you know, more interesting forms of interest. I will bring you some stories, I'm sure you can also find these stories. Uh, actually, one of the things you guys can do is put an alert on Google for artificial intelligence news stories. I do this, and every day I get like a huge number of stories. Like for example, yesterday I got an extremely important story that apparently people don't think that having a sex with a robot is cheating. It's extremely important stuff, of stuff like this. Even that is an AI story right now. Okay. So, Everything is AI these days. Uh, ethics is AI, and uh, adding numbers is AI. And my hope is that by taking this course, you will actually know how to get to this stage. OK. Um, so that's the rise of AI talk. And then actually, there's a lot more to that. In fact, that we'll get to, which is this issue of representations that are interpretable to us versus you know, made by the you know, machine itself. And that's something that becomes an important issue to understand the current debates about AI. I'll actually bring back to that point again sometime. Okay. And then we talked about environment types, which is like you know the second chapter. There are different kinds of environments, and we looked at uh, differentiating them in terms of uh, properties such as are they sta static versus dynamic? Are they fully versus partially versus not accessible? Okay, and are they uh, stochastic versus deterministic? Are they episodic versus non-episodic? Are they discrete versus continuous? And these were important distinctions. It turns out that when you are trying to solve a new problem, if the environment of that problem basically, you know, if any in all the things that I said, the first one are the easy part. You know, if, if you, the words that are the easiest words are the ones that are static that are deterministic, that are fully accessible, that are episodic, and that are discrete. <coughs> Otherwise, things become hard. But obviously, you know, there are lots and lots of words which are on the other end. Uh, and some words which are like in the middle of the spectrum for one thing, and probably easier for other and other parts. So it's a very useful categorization to keep in mind. Okay, I hope you understood. Are there any questions on environment types? Yes. Uh, you spoke about how an environment has so many different agents. Uh, how do we, like, the the agent's perspective about the environment differs, right? So how do we decide what kind of environment it is? Is it accessible or not? What do you mean? Okay, so uh, so an age for one agent... The so you're saying, can the agent know whether the environment is accessible or not? No, is no. Is that your question? Uh, no, sir. Uh, basically, for one agent. If that was a question, that's a great question. <laughs> I would like to ask that. But, I'll go to the other question. Okay. For one agent, the environment might be accessible. For another agent, it might not be. That's so. also a good question. Um, that just depends on. So, so, in fact, there are two very interesting points of view. Okay? One is who gets to decide whether an environment is accessible or not? Okay? An agent in that environment might come to a conclusion thinking everything seems to be completely you know, visible to me, so I'm assuming that it's fully accessible to me. Okay, so if I'm colorblind, okay, uh, the guy who taught me AI back when I was a like, you know, grad student uh, was colorblind, and uh, so he would actually basically at some point of time realize that he's colorblind, and then he started to get back at the rest of the people by wearing parrot green pants and pink shirts and so on. And so he would look fine for himself when he looks himself in the mirror, but he'll all, you know, close our eyes. Okay. The point is, he, a colorblind guy looks at the environment and thinks, yeah, I completely can see everything. But I'm missing the color. 
I don't know that I'm missing the color until you know somebody tells me that I'm missing the color. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, and so, in fact, whether or not something is accessible to some extent, you are doing an oracular decision. You know, that sort of answers your second question too. So, assuming that for somebody who has a reasonable set of capabilities, is this environment fully accessible? Is this stochastic, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. That also gets you to the point that something that is actually deterministic for one agent might be stochastic for another agent. For a young person, so so for example, walking on a line is deterministic for most of you, except when you have had one too many drinks. Then it becomes stochastic, and then you get a ticket, right? So it's like the same environment used to be deterministic before the drink became stochastic after the drink. So that's also possible. So in some sense. When I say it's a deterministic environment, what I meant is by default for non-drunk people is deterministic. But what can I do if you are drunk? And similarly, in fact, when we say that the world is fully accessible, we are again making an assumption that drinking has some sort of a value judgment. You know, there is this judgment that you're kind of crazy to have drunk and started driving. But imagine somebody who is deaf or blind or colorblind. There is no value judgment there. They just basically they didn't do it to themselves. It's just that's the way they are there. Okay. In which case, it still would be the case that the world would be a harder world. The same world is easier for you than to them. And we actually talk about this, you know, that how does, for example, loss of sight make a problem much harder? <coughs> okay. Um, yes. Okay. Wouldn't you say with the example like walking on the line that both examples... Speak louder, I can't hear. Wouldn't you say with the, the walking on the line example that both were actually stochastic and it was just a change of probabilities, not a change from... Yeah, the, the point about the second part of all of these is, so first of all, these are spectrums, and then we are giving names to the endpoints. Okay, and it's the spectrum is such that this side is more general than this side. So you can always say everything is just a... Um, watered down version of the most general version. So you are right that if you are thinking of just working on the hardest problem, and if you just work on stochastic, inaccessible or partially accessible, uh, multi-agent, um, that is dynamic, um, and uh, non-episodic and continuous worlds, then you would also have handled the simpler, simpler case. But then the simpler cases have cheaper algorithms. So that's the reason you go from here to one way. Okay. So it is true that everything is sort of stochastic, but we do expect that you know we think pieces of the world are deterministic. Okay. If the probabilities are quite weighted such that the most likely outcome comes with 0.9999999999 probability, and the other outcomes have a much lower probability, you just assume it's deterministic. But there is really nothing deterministic. In the world. Like, I mean, everything that you can see. Except in computer games, even there, there's nothing deterministic. Right? Because as you make the move, suppose like the Palo Verde nuclear plant goes out the back and, and there's a power fluctuation and the computer shuts down. So the move doesn't have the intended consequences. Instead, your computer shuts down. So everything is in some sense, you know. So as I said, you can never go wrong by being pessimistic in the world. <laughs> right? If you think things are really, really bad, nobody can prove you wrong. It's just that you might sort of end it up. That's not a good thing. But you know, on the other hand, you know, there are easier cases if you have, if you, you know, if you actually realize that the world has simple problems. Yes. Uh, there was another question. Yes. So you just said that that's also a kind of a spectrum. I mean, it's like the, the question is how serious are we that it is fully absorbed? So, for example, courses, you know, you take courses, you get grades in it, right? That's what you're doing, that's your life right now, right? Is this episodic or non episodic? You would say episodic because if I don't like this course, next semester I'll do another set of courses. But on the other hand, it's also non episodic because there's a total amount of times you can take courses. And so as you keep using it, how many times can you do, take courses and fail and redo it again? There's only so much. So there will be other constraints which make it a little more non-episodic. 
Okay, all of them are indeed spectral. Yes. Uh, in case of a non-episodic uh, environment, <coughs> do we allow the agent to learn from its experience? Like we are we to not allow agents to learn from their experience. All agents should learn from their experience. That's not a problem. So it's not a question of they can learn. So, so your point is, if it is non-episodic, can you learn? So here is a very, very interesting question. Is human life episodic or non-episodic? How many of you are Hindus here? You believe that it is episodic. If you don't do it well this time, next time you'll do it better. Right? The rest of you think it's you know, basic and episodic. The Hindus think it's episodic. Um, if I don't do it well this time, the next time around, I can do it again. Okay. Um, the rest of you think is that's it. You know, after this, you either go to heaven or hell. Okay. But um, all of that is bogus. But essentially, the real question is, is bogus. how is it that even though lives are non-episodic, lives are non-episodic. You know, come, come to real senses. You know, lives are non-episodic. But how is it that people learn? You don't learn. But we do. You see what I'm saying? So you go and then basically try to pose at the edge of Grand Canyon and you fall down. <laughs> right? We all learn something very really useful. <laughs> Human race learns something useful. And that's where oral traditions, written word, all of these became very important. So, you know, non episodic. Individuals do stupid things and die, and the rest of us learn a lot. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? So learning is possible in this other multi-agent scenario. A single agent stuck on Mars, spirit or rover, you know, say, hey, it looks like a nice place to go in, and it tries to go in and falls down, falls on its face. Nothing. It's not going to learn anything. There's no other spirit looking over it. In part of the part. But so, whereas when you fall down, we are, the New York Times is writing an article, we are all laughing at you, and then we are learning something. That's kind of very useful. Yes? So, learning the same is not Well, that's of course true. That's of course true. Again, those are kinds of things. So, this issue, this is actually a very deep question. Um, again, the beginning parts, so there's this beautiful saying that life can only be lived forward, but it only makes sense in the backward direction. So when at the end of the life, you look back at your life, it makes all no sense. Okay. But unfortunately, you can only live it forward. Forces also are like that. Okay. And many of these general discussions that we are having in the first couple of classes don't make, may not make too much sense to you, but if only you can go back and look at them at the end of the course. I know the last, at the end of the course, the thing that you want to do is sell your textbooks and go the videos and move on. But if you go back and look at it, you say, ah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So one important point that your question raises is if you have a model, I mean, if you learn something, is that learning telling you the way the world works in terms of a causal model, or is it a correlational model? Okay. A correlation is when this happens, I see this happening. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is causing this or this is causing this. Most learning essentially just gets correlations. Going from <coughs> correlations to causation is what all of human civilization has been about. Okay, your great 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 ancestors knew that sun comes up in the morning, goes down in the evening. They had no clue as to why that happens. They came up with all sorts of fancy theories. They said, of course, you know, Earth is in the center of the universe, and Sun is just going around the Earth. And then there was some problem, they will make the model a little more complex. They will problem become a little more complex. And these are all supposedly causal models they were making. And then the way you show that a causal model is wrong is, in fact, you heard about this fact that science is all about falsifiable hypotheses. So, you know, if you have a causal model, there should be a hypothesis for which you should be able to set up it. You know, experiment and show that you know whether it actually succeeds or fails. And any time experiment shows that the causal model is wrong, is when you learn something and you realize that you have to change the model. And in fact, um, at one time I was in Madrid and, uh, and actually one of the you know Spanish um, 
royal museums, and uh, I saw a series of eccentric models of the universe, each more complex than the other, because they find problems with you know putting the Earth in the middle, and they kept finding solutions for it. Patch, 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 patch. Okay. Um, and then, of course, Copernicus came along and said, you have with this entirely complex model, just put sun in the middle, everything goes fine. So going from correlational model, which you knew, to causal model is a much bigger deal. And in fact, a lot of the angst about use of AI technology, apparently, to the societal problems, is the worry that machine learning techniques learn correlational models. And they don't learn necessarily causal models. But people might use them as causal models. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is the problem. So if you look at, I don't know whether I mentioned this in one of the talks or not, but you know, if you go to Google and the images and say, professor, you look at the pictures, let's say the first 100 pictures, 98 of them will be, and maybe 90 of them will be white males. Okay, and then maybe some of them will be brown males, and then a couple would be uh, female, a female. Okay, now the question is, if you have a machine learning system learning theories of what makes a professor, and it looks for data, it goes to Google. Google is, of course, the great repository of all data. It says, yeah, this must be professors. Let me find a theory for professorship. Professorship involves being white and having gray hair. So if I get somebody, then I just you know basically decide whether or not they are professors by these rules. That is a huge problem. Because what Google Images is telling you is the current state of the world. It does not tell you anything about the causation. So the simple question that you asked has these huge consequences. And we'll keep coming back to this issue of correlation versus causation. Okay, causal models are what we take pride in as human beings. The fact that we figured out that sun has to be in the middle is a huge thing. The fact that we figured out that the sun comes up in the morning and goes down in the evening, that's like, if you don't even figure that out, you're like, what's the puppy? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Puppies still haven't figured out that sun is in the middle for the brand races. At least they haven't told Yes. <laughs> is this also kind of the concern with using, uh, I think there was a reference to like a research paper that was trying to use uh, image recognition to determine if uh, it was a criminal? Yes, in the same exact question. So because it's just finding a theory. You know, other theory is a correlational theory. If you look like this, then maybe you are a criminal. So don't look like this. Then you'll suddenly become non-criminal. Okay, and this issue is a, again, you know, many of these things will wind up having pretty, you know, significant impacts on the society. It, they always had. It's just that AI was not a household term before. People did that, think that, that, think that AI is going to change everybody's life. So I knew it, but they did. The rest of the people didn't. Now everybody knows. There are there's a large amount of angst. And so you can kind of make sense of, you know, it's, you know, how to throw away the bathwater without the baby. Yes. And so I, I also have been hearing a lot of the news that there's a lot of talk from uh, influential people about trying to regulate AI more. Is that like along the lines of what? Yeah, you can regulate what you can kind of understand. Elon Musk is a bozo. As far as AI is concerned, he hasn't written a single AI paper. He's a, I will buy a car from him. I'll also go to space with him. But I will only take his AI word seriously if he has actually has shown a lot more of a technical expertise in AI. He is the one who is saying, let's regulate certain types of AI. Things like making decisions based on, so first of all, the regulation part, there are multiple pieces to it. Okay. Um, you can talk about regulating AI research, which is what Elon Musk was talking about. So we may be referring to that. There's also regulating the decisions that any AI system makes. How many of you know about GDPR? Um, this is this European Union. Has somebody raised their hand? No, there you go. So what is GDPR? Okay, I think I know. Is it that like uh, the private, you have to maintain a certain level of privacy? So if you, if you ask somebody to remove all your pictures? That's one of it. So basically GDPR stands for Generalized Data Protection Regulations. And 
This is European Union came up with them. They put up for the public comment that it's supposedly going to become law starting like 2018 sometime, like May or something. And one of the questions that they have, one of the things that they have there is the right to be at the one that you are, I think, mentioning is right to be forgotten. <coughs> that the internet should be able to forget you. If you did something stupid, you know, it should not keep coming whenever I type your name. After a while, it should be forgotten. Um, and then there is the other question of uh, right for right to an explanation. If a system makes a decision that affects your life, you are entitled to an explanation. This is huge. This is like real, really huge. Okay, it looks great in when you write it, but in fact, what does it mean for a system making a decision that affects your life? If a system says, look at this particular page. As a, you know, Facebook says, you know, or, or Google says, you know, look at this page. And you look at that page and you have a heart attack because there's a really bad picture that scared you or something. You die. Okay. Is, am I supposed to essentially provide an explanation to your kids and games as to why we thought it's a reasonable thing to show you? And exactly how do we provide that explanation? But those are the kinds of issues people are really thinking about. You know, that's another type of regulation that people are worried about. Yes. So you would probably say the kind that Elon Musk is going for is mainly to uh, provide a more competitive advantage for his business? I don't know. I'm not saying that. Okay. I said enough you know, bad things about him. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I want to keep the chance of me getting a free Tesla at non-zero. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so that's everyone types. And then you look also at agent, agent architectures. In fact, that's something that I want to get to, but we're actually going to explore. But, let me see, so that's a little thing. Um, okay, so this was the whole discussion about uh, uh, Ajit Pai, is the FCC chairman. He was um, here, so while I didn't show up for the class, I did come home at 12 o'clock last Wednesday, and he showed up at 3.30, and we had to talk until about 5.30 or something, about whether FCC should be sort of in the business of regulating something related to it. So you have to hope that said the right things. Not that anybody listens to me. But anyway, so he also kind of, made, and I, as I said, I came through that Rise of AI thing and you know, he sort of you know, gave a summary of it. Um, so that you can, if you need this notes, you can read his summary. Uh, the other thing, of course, is anytime you know, I say Ajit Pai and FCC, at least some of you who are actually keeping track of news uh, might be thinking, what about the Lisa Scott? Just uh, what about the elephant in the room? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so, 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 yes, so, the net neutrality aspect, really, you know, I can assure you, you don't need to worry about net neutrality. Whatever happens to net, 471 videos will be on the past layer. So, you will still be able to watch it. The rest are the problem. Okay, so that part we will really have it. Okay, so, I'm going to back to it. Now, take a minute right now, and I will set this up. And right, these two or three surprising things you learned in watching the videos last week. Again, you have to do this answer correctly so that we have answers.
Aren't you happy that I didn't put the names there? Watching it, you won't have time to write yours. <laughs> yeah, I'll wait for another 30 seconds and close this. And these are supposed to be elevator pitches. Yeah. 